Hello everyone, uh, thanks for joining us today's uh, UFMRM webinar. Uh, today we are very happy to have Dr. Ricardo Martins from Sheffield University who just become a father one week ago. And congratulations, Ricardo. Thank you. So he's going to talk about uh, the dual drainage model and using different uh, models. So the floor is yours, Ricardo. Thank you, Albert. Um, as Albert mentioned, my name is uh, Ricardo Martins, and I will be uh, giving a small presentation um, of a work uh, I did while I was at the University of Coimbra in Portugal, uh, collaborating with Dr. Jorge Leandro from Technical University of Munich uh, in Germany, uh, Dr. Albert Chen, and Professor Slobodan Jordiewicz from the University of Exeter in the United Kingdom. Uh, the work uh, title is as shown. It's a comparison of three dual drainage models, in this case, the surface model, shallow waters, local inertial, and diffusive wave model. In this case, the goal is to compare, to compare what happens uh, in the surface models during a flood uh, led by a dual drainage event. I will begin by showing uh, a small presentation structure. And during the presentation, I'll give a small introduction on what is dual drainage and show some cases where surcharge happens. I will explain the methodology followed, uh, namely by explaining the sewer model used uh, all the three overland flow mo flood models and how the connection was done. Uh, then I'll explain the parameters used to, to compare and evaluate the models. And I'll explain the, um, the area for the case study used. Finally, I will show um, the volume, discharge, and extent. In this case, the three parameters analyzed to compare all the models and end with the conclusions drawn. So first of all, uh, it, it, it needs to be said that the drainage systems are designed to be effective only for a return period. While uh, within this return period, the flow is normally conveyed inside the gullies and gutters, and as such, the flow is removed from the urban surface. Uh, the problem is that every now and then, the drainage system is not capable of conveying all the flow because the intensity exceeds the drainage system capacity. This causes disruption in the urban fabric and leads to some problems. Uh, these are just some videos, uh, just show a small example of what can happen during a high intensity short event. On the lower left corner, you have an idea on how intense it was, the, the precipitation. Top left, there is a small flooded area uh, that had some disruption. On the top right, there is a manhole that's situate, situated, if you see in the video on the left, and above the, the brick wall that, um, that manhole was situated there. And on the lower right corner, another flooded area uh, with some vehicles being stopped because of that. Now, what you see in the top right corner is a very small surcharge event in a separative system. What happens in a more serious surcharge uh, is completely different, and things get a lot worse when the sewer system uh, is no longer a separative, but it, it's a unitary. On the left, we have an event in the US with a massive urban geyser due to transients um, that causes a lot of damage on the, the parked car and lifts the car to almost two meters. And on the right, you can see an event in Philippines um, where I honestly hope that the color of water is due to the transport of silts and clays and not because it is a unitary system. So the question is, what can we do? How can we predict these events to minimize their effect? Since I am a modeler, I have to say that creating better and more accurate models capable of replicating these events is the solution. Uh, this can be achieved by having a 1D sewer model, a 2D overland flow model, and a good linkage model. 
on the simulations performed, uh, we used the 1D model. It was Sibson. Sibson is a 1D fully dynamic model that relies on the Savena equations to model the flow in the pipes and the mass and energy conservation equations in the nodes. Uh, it also makes use, makes use of the Priceman box scheme to integrate the equations and also relies on a subdivision of the pipes for an improved accuracy of the flow inside the pipes. Uh, when the flow depth exceed, exceeds the crest of the pipe, uh, the numerical model uses the Priceman open slot concept to simulate the pressurized flows. And since this, metho this method is completely implicit, uh, it is unconditionally stable. For the surface models, um, the three models used were the shallow water equations uh, that uses uh, a first order um, Riemann solver. The three models used, sorry, were the shallow water equations, the local inertial equations, and diffusive wave models. Uh, the shallow water equations are as presented. The first one is the mass equation. The second and the third are the momentum, according to x and y, respectively. The second and third are composed of local accelerations, pressure terms, pressure, pressure acceleration terms, convex, convective accelerations, bed elevation terms, and friction terms. And in order to integrate these equations for the shallow water and for the local inertial, a first order Rho Riemann solver uh, was used. It has several advantages from which I want to point out the robustness, the ability to be upwinding, that is, uh, the propagation of the numerical model is the same as the wave, the direction. Uh, it is shock capturing and allows for well-balanced source terms. In the 1D uh, case, the shallow water equations allow the propagation in two directions with two characteristics. In this case, u plus the celerity, which is the square root of gh, and u minus the celerity. The local inertial equations, or the gravity wave model, neglects the convective terms uh, and keeps all uh, the other terms. Uh, therefore, it has a different wave speed, which is plus the celerity and minus the celerity in a 1D case, um, and the numerical scheme is the same as the used for the shallow water equations, but adapted to the, to the different equations. The diffusive wave model, uh, PD wave, neglects all but the pressure acceleration, and the bed elevation terms, and the friction terms has no backwater effect uh, and is very diffusive. Uh, these equations were computed using a finite volume structured uh, centered scheme with unstaggered variables. For one of the most important parts of this work, the connection, the linkage, uh, the assumption made is that the manhole covers are displaced in a flood event and they allow for free flow in both directions. As such, assuming that, we have four scenarios. The first one, the top left, we have flow from the manhole with water level, level in the surface that is below the crest. On the second one, we have inflow to the manhole, uh, basically the flow, the um, the level on the surface is above the water, the, the manhole crest. The third one is the flow from the manhole to the surface uh, with the water level above the crest. It's sort of a surcharge, if surcharge the event. And the fourth one is from the, f from the surface to a surcharged manhole. With this, um, with this four situations, generically using the first equation, we can uh, have represented almost all the, um, the drainage and surcharge, the inflow and surcharge um, numerically. So since the numerical models, uh, the sewer and overflow, overland flow have different time steps, the best option is to do a synchronization based upon an interpolation of the 1D depths. Uh, and the exchange cannot be done every time step 
reducing the time step of the 1D to the 1D to the 2D size uh, would render the 2D too slow. As such, the 1D model computes first the 1D step. This value used to create interpolated values um, that will be used in the 2D model. And afterwards, every 2D time step, the depths are recalculated for the 1D uh, temporary uh, or interpolated uh, depth or pressure and the 2D model until the 2D model reaches the 1D time step. When this happens, the 1D model is finally updated with the values exchanged and is ready for computing the next time step. In the comparison parameters, uh, we assume that no model was correct, nor shallow water, diffusive, or local inertial gravity wave model. Uh, none of them, we assumed that none was correct, and we wanted to make a comparison between them all. As such, for example, the volume exchange, the difference is calculated as the difference between the models divided by the algebraic average between the models, and uh, not as usually as one of them. For the hydraulic head and for the discharge rates, we used three well-known statistical parameters. We used p-bias, uh, the normalized root mean squared error, and the Pearson correlation. And for the inundation extent and model predominance, it was calculated using a novel coefficient based on an RGB scale and the extent agreement based on a coefficient that punishes cells with different, uh, that are not in agreement. That is, that they don't have, one model has a wet cell, the other one has a dry cell. The area for the, for the case study situated in Keithley, in Bradford, in the north of the United Kingdom. The catchment area is characterized by slopes that vary from 0.14% to 2.44%, with an average of 1.33. It has 0.18 square kilometers of surface, and the drainage system consists of 90 pipes and 90 manholes. It has a combined sewer overflow uh, near node 16, which is by the end of the, um, of the exit of the area. And that discharges to the river nearby in, in case of a surcharge event. Uh, the network is fed by three major catchments, uh, with the largest being roughly 5.5 square kilometers that is um, inserted at node 1. The simulation was based on a synthetic block of rainfall of 44 millimeters in one hour, which corresponds to, to a 100-year return period event for that region. And the rainfall runoff is computed using a kinematic model and is introduced directly in the pipe network system. As for results, on the left image, uh, you can see the exchange volume between the models on the left axis, on the right axis, the difference between each module, each model. Uh, the total surface volume is slightly higher in the gravity wave model, and the difference obtained in the first hour um, for PD wave, uh, especially, are due to PD wave's smaller wave propagation, uh, which imply a bigger depth upstream and therefore less exchange from sewer to surface, um, in this case, in the diffusive wave model. Uh, the difference, in this case, the right, um, the right axis and the dashed lines, the dotted dash and the yellow line, at the end of simulation, are below 0.16% for all surface models. The image on the right uh, shows the discharged volume every minute. The differences are very small and the volume is almost the same. Uh, once more, the exception is PD wave. The major difference uh, that is found at one hour is roughly four uh, cubic meters of difference for a discharged volume of 300 cubic meters on that minute, which is uh, still very low. 
analyzing the the exchanged discharge and the manhole head um, we've made the, we've used the, the statistical parameters and the, the the left figure is divided into six figures uh, we have the three coefficients on the columns sequentially the bias um, root mean square error and the Pearson and the top row represent the manhole head the bottom row the discharge each um, each marker represents one manhole uh, or one or the data for one manhole for the P bias one can see that the PD wave has a higher hydraulic head and discharge for the majority of the manholes that is the tendency uh, all the values are positive if you subtract the the red ones if you notice that it's PD wave minus the values for shallow water the, the the most of the values are positive and that shows exactly that the um, the PD wave has a higher hydraulic head and discharge for the majority of the manholes the shallow water equations have a slightly higher head than the the gravity wave however it's it's very close discharge on the normalized root mean square error PD wave distances itself from both the gravity wave and the shallow water as seen by an almost diagonal line the difference also between the gravity wave and the shallow water is very small with values that go beneath 0 0.02 in both the manhole head and discharges the Pearson correlation shows that the time series for the gravity wave and the shallow water have considerably higher correlations than the one with PD wave regarding the discharge and manhole heads the the point 3056 um, was the point with worst correlation the situation here was that the bed elevation for this point in PD wave was 85.26 due to the mesh creation because it was structured and in the shallow water and gravity wave it was 85.16 which meant a 10 centimeters difference uh, the crest of the manhole was in gravity wave and shallow water 85.13 and as such uh, it was slightly higher in gravity wave and it was a lot more in PD wave because of this effect after the first hour the manhole has no inflow from PD wave and it has some inflow from the gravity wave or the shallow water uh, it is shown here just as, as an example to demonstrate that the, the a difference in mesh can have some impact on the final results so in order to get a better idea of what was happening in the catchment uh, and what model had the higher depth and sort of dominated a cell or a, or an area uh, a novel methodology based on an RGB scale was created uh, which meant to be the, the expression on top was applied to each computational cell the expression divides the depth for each model by the average of the three models and then attributes to each model a color that is uh, red green and blue uh, as shown in the triangle and it also uses secondary colors a green color for example shows that the gravity wave model uh, was higher than the average of the th three models and based on the pattern obtained on the left image the the catchment was divided into seven areas and the the relation between each two models was computed or presented as a, um, as a scatter plot vertically and horizontally one can see the depths for each model and for each cell each marker is again one cell uh, diagonal di diagonal lines are the 95% confidence interval and one can see that at minute 50 uh, the only noticeable difference uh, is for area 4 where the gravity wave and the shallow water depth is higher than the PD wave uh, area 7 also has some depth 
for shallow water and gravity wave but not for PD wave. At minute 80 both area 6 and 7 have some differences between PD wave and the gravity wave and shallow water and between themselves uh, especially area 6. At minute 110 the difference becomes smaller than minute 80 however there are more scattered points that have some differences between the models, some loose cells. For the maximum depth obtained at each cell, the areas with major differences lie in the area 4, 6 and 7 for all models. Uh, despite the small differences, the agreement between all models is still very good. Uh, this is visible in the image where the maximum extent is shown and the difference is highlighted uh, the values for the differences between for example shallow water and gravity wave are in the vast uh, majority less than two centimeters um, for the difference between the, the other two models and PD wave are still below 10 centimeters um, globally so there isn't much difference and the extent is approximately the same. So just to have an idea on how the differences propagate, uh, this video shows the difference between uh, all uh, three models. On the first one is the shallow water uh, minus gravity wave model. On the second one is the shallow water minus PD wave. The bottom one bottom left one is the gravity wave minus PD wave and the bottom right is just the, the extent as shown from the gravity wave model. The difference is even not even if you don't just consider the maximum extent but it, on a time-wise um, discretization they are still they are very low. Finally, a coefficient was used that allows for the comparison of number of wet and dry cells. Uh, this coefficient punishes cells with different values. Uh, in this case, the CW, comma D, and the CD, comma W. And you can see on the left images, on the left image, uh, the number of cells in all models, uh, the common cells between two models and the combination of all three models. Uh, on the right, the coefficient was applied to the whole simulation uh, every 10 minutes. On the left, uh, in grey, the amount of cells in total ag agreement is very large, is more than 10,000 cells. Um, PD wave, however, has a slight disagreement uh, since the, the number of wet cells that are not wet in other models is also, right, is also high, uh, which is the red line. On the right, the, there is a very good agreement between the shallow water and the gravity wave. In conclusion, uh, three overland flow models were evaluated and compared. For the sake of uh, comparison, the same uh, sewer network model, Sipson, uh, was used. The evaluation was done without assuming any model as the benchmark. A new linkage uh, was proposed based on interpolation between time steps. The results are consistent between all coupled models in terms of extent, depth and volume. PD wave showed a higher maximum flood depth and a slower uh, propagation of the flood front when compared to the other two models. The gravity wave showed higher depths uh, downstream because the, the wave front is slower when compared to the shallow water uh, equations. Overall, the results show a better agreement between the gravity wave and the shallow water. However, uh, it was noticeable that simplified overland models can produce comparable results to fully dynamic models and they still have uh, less, they have a uh, smaller computational cost. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ricardo. Very interesting talk and very colorful.
Do we have questions from our audience? Uh, if not, may I start with the question? How does the time compare between these three models? The computing time, I mean. Um, I forgot to add that number. Uh, PD wave and shallow water, I believe um, they were 181 minutes. So basically the idea is the shallow water takes 1.5 times the other models. Um, I think it was 188, 183 for the PD wave and the gravity wave and 284 for the shallow water. I can hear you very low. Michael, okay. Thank you, Ricardo. It's a very interesting presentation. How that stole my um, question there. Uh, I was wondering, on top, if uh, the terrain would make much difference in a much steeper terrain or one with less buildings in things like this. Um, indeed, it would. the The slopes were not that high for the for the catchment, and whenever you have steep slopes, the diffusive wave model and the local inertial, uh, they are not so precise. If you have small areas with steep terrain, uh, they don't pose a problem in the, in the overall simulation. However, when the steep slopes become dominant. Uh, things become more difficult for both simplified models. Uh, regarding the buildings, the buildings were included in the simulation as um, a displacement in the, in the bed elevation. So what could have been done and could have been improved is to use an unstructured mesh and completely remove the whole, the whole buildings. And that way, we could have some different results. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. Are we having some sound problems? Sorry, okay, probably I uh, was on mute. So, so thank you very much, Ricardo. And so, if there's no further question, I would like to close the webinar today, and we will share the videos and uh, uh, slides on our usual channels. And please join us next time. And thank you, Ricardo, for giving this interesting presentation. And we will see you next time. Thank okay. you. Thank you.